<laughs> Could you imagine having to take a photograph, or worse yet, film something, and have no clue what the exposure was? I mean, even this old SLR Canon from 1976 still has through the lens metering. But imagine if there was no built-in meter inside of your camera. That means no false color, no zebras, no waveform, no histogram, nothing. Well, that's what life was like for both filmers and photographers back in the early 60s. There were no cameras with through the lens metering available for prosumers and definitely not for hobbyists. Back then, that technology belonged to only one company, Topcon, which had a price point that only attracted the elites. I'm talking Olympian photographers and the Japanese Navy. So that means you either had to have a crap ton of experience in lighting and formed a natural eye, or carried a light meter with you at all times, or you just happened to be wealthy enough to own a separate viewfinder that had a built-in meter. Otherwise, it was all left up to the gods. But then something in April of 1966 occurred. This little company called Minolta released a new camera, the SRT-101. For the first time ever, now everyone had access to a camera with through-the-lens metering. We're talking groundbreaking technology that would be adopted, advanced, and carried on throughout the decades, even to our present day of 2022. And with this new camera was launched some of the most interesting glass that can be found in our vintage market, the MC Record. The MC stood for meter coupled, which let folks know these are the lenses that will help you nail exposure. But now something else was also happening at that time in the late 60s. One of the camera industry's leading companies, Lights, AKA Leica, were arguably on the verge of bankruptcy. Meanwhile, this little company that named their lenses after a mountain range in Japan was dominating the markets with their new groundbreaking camera. Everyone wanted a piece of that sweet Minolta pie, amateurs and professionals alike. Cut to 1972. Leica forms an R&D partnership with Minolta, researching, developing, and swapping ideas and innovations. Just one year later, in 1973, Minolta launches the third generation of their Raccord lenses, the MC Mark III's, more incorrectly referred to as MCX. But don't let internet folklore lead you all astray. An MC Mark III is an MC Mark III. The X was just simply Minolta's way of notating for North American markets. Along with this launch of these new meter-coupled Raccords, two of those lenses were really sparking a lot of interest amongst Minolta's competition. The first one being the 16mm f2.8 fisheye lens. We'll save that one for a video of its own. But the real gem of 1973 was this bad boy right here. The 24mm MCW Raccord SI. The SI stands for nine elements in seven groups. What made this little ultra-wide lens so special was its floating element focusing for near-range correction. This little guy can close focus up to 0.3 meters, which is just shy of 12 inches. Everyone loved this lens, including their partners over at Leica. In fact, they loved it so much, they took the glass, rehoused and rebadged it for their own Leica R El Merit line. Now, this is where collectors and aficionados are running to the comments to prove me wrong, but I cannot unsee what I have already seen. Countless of videos online of people's little Leica R El Merit 24s flaring and performing just like my little Minolta SI. In fact, Erwin Putz, rest in peace, was one of the most highly renowned Leica experts and historians, wrote this in one of his publications. <clears throat> Quote, in the beginning, Minolta supplied the glass elements and lights did the assembly. Later, when Minolta stopped production, Leica continued to produce the lens." End quote. Now, because of this Minolta history, that's one of the reasons why most die-hard Leica collectors steer clear of the Leica El Merit 24mm altogether. But the whole point of this video was to see if I could save myself two grand and cut a little Minolta 24 with a set of Leica Rs. Now, here's the trick to getting the Minolta copy or Leica copy, depending on how you look at it. The specific 24 mil that Leica adopted says SI on it, because two years later, Minolta relaunched and redesigned this lens, but kept it in the same MC Mark III design. So if it does not say SI on it, then it is not going to be the Leica copy. 
So now we're gonna watch some super casual documentary style footage that I captured of my good friend and fellow filmmaker, Matt Leal, jamming on his Martin acoustic guitar. It's the same scene, it's just one clip I shot using the Minolta 24, and the other I used this little Leica El Merit R28. Now I know it's not a true versus 24 versus 24, but again, it's not about that. It's more about seeing if you can stomach having a lens not in a true Leica body, but still match with the rest of your set. Just trying to see if I can save people a couple bucks, or, you know, more like a couple thousand. But there is something else kind of important to consider here that may disprove this entire theory. Leica never obsessed over their coatings the way Minolta did. So the footage may not match perfectly just based on the coatings alone. I mean, let's be honest here, even a full set of Leica Rs from the same exact year don't even always match. And that's simply because Leica just did not spend a whole lot of energy on matching their coatings. Instead, they were more focused on the performance of the actual lens itself, and they did this by balancing the micro contrast with the overall contrast, which ultimately was a process that renders that sexy, creamy Leica look that everyone seems to be obsessed with. And they did this by boosting the MTF cycles by a lot, like a whole lot. And this is actually a technique that they taught to their partners over at Minolta. Meanwhile, Minolta was highly regarded for their quality control, especially when it came to the consistency of their coatings and their colorimetry. In other words, I can cut one MC record from 1973 with an MD record from 1978. Now this is because Minolta was one of the only companies that made their lenses themselves from the ground up. There was no outsourcing going on over there at the Minolta factory. All the other companies like Zeiss, Leica, Canon, Olympus, they were all outsourcing components to make both their lenses and camera bodies. Meanwhile, this weird company Minolta was doing everything themselves under their own roof. Yeah, we're gonna see a lot more videos on this channel about Minolta. It's just too damn interesting to shy away from. But let's see what happens. Roll the tape. So, you know, the jury might still be out on that one. And just for all my diehard Leica R lovers, the 28 I was using was from 1971. Real vintage. You know, the ones that nobody wants. Because being someone that was born in the early 80s, it's really hard for me to call something from the 80s vintage. It just really hurts my soul. And in my opinion, these old ones still look awesome. And honestly, did you really tell what year that Leica was from, from this footage? Don't lie to yourself, man. Come on, you're better than that. But all jokes aside, let's get back to the comparison and I'll share with you my thoughts and we'll see what you think. Now the skin tones look fairly even to me, which may just be the most important thing. However, there does seem to be a certain richness to the Leica and this really stands out on the shots of the guitar and the shoes 
or even the stream of coffee. Also take note of the slight vignetting on the Minolta, and this is something that all records were infamously known for. Not as big of a deal on Super 35, but if you're on full frame, that could very well be a deal breaker. Something else that I noticed right off the bat is how well the Leica handles the highlights. The Leica just really has a nice soft glow on those highlights if we look at this cup shot, while the Minolta really teeters toward more of a sharp digital look. Plus the Minolta definitely has some weird color fringing going on and it definitely flares way easier, not to mention it does suffer from pretty horrible ghosting. I'm talking about these weird internal reflections. This is what you're seeing right here. Now this is something that is pretty detrimental that I have found with all of the MC records. They all suffer from this horrible ghosting effect when in a backlit situation. And honestly, that's something I only ever noticed before when I'm stacking filters. It's the first time I've seen lenses do something like that on their own. It's not necessarily a deal breaker, but you'll definitely want to make sure you're always shooting with a map box and top flag because of this. Now for this little shoot, I was just completely handheld. The Komodo was stripped all the way down, no map box, no nothing. And honestly, maybe the Leica did have a foot up on this one because I was using its little hood. So maybe that wasn't exactly fair of me. However, the most revealing thing for me when doing this was how close a 28 mil and a 24 mil really are. I mean, do you really need both anyways? It's literally just the matter of taking one step forward or back. I don't know, let me know your guys' thoughts in the comments below. And if you're interested in going on a virtual behind the scenes journey with me and all the jobs I do out here in LA as a cinematographer and a gaffer, then I encourage you to check out the Dog Times Patreon. Shout out to all my Patreon supporters and special thanks to the members of the producers tier, Mike Skinner and Fred Parr. Thanks for stopping by. And for now, that is a wrap. Was the voice weird? Was I doing like a Batman voice? It seemed like a Batman voice. You know what it is? There's been too many uh, comments. Uh, this has mainly been in the beginning. I don't get these comments anymore, but certainly within like the first year of me doing YouTube, I got countless and countless number of comments of people saying how crazy my voice sounded, how it sounded like I didn't have balls and all this stupid shit. So now like I think I have that ingrained in the back of my brain and now I'm just always like, you know, trying to drop it. And it turns into like Christian Bale. Now I'm Batman. I don't know. It is what it is, folks. All right. <laughs> I've slowly been taking photographs with this, one role in this. I've yet to have it developed. And I think the same role has been in here for like, since like 2019. So I don't even know, is it still good? I, I don't even know. I got pictures left on this though. A lot actually, like 26 pictures left on this. Or is that how many I've taken? It counts down, right? Or does it count up? I don't know. I never use analog cameras. Who am I kidding? <clears throat> All right, let's cut it.